uh, Dr. Swami, who has done so much to conscientize the people and to bring uh, people who should be in jail, trying very hard to put them in jail, although I doubt very much the system is going to support him in this. And I, my friend Jagdish Shetty, who invited me here, has a very evolved sense of humor because I'm a complete techno dinosaur. I mean, I have a Twitter handle which I never use. I have, somebody has made a Facebook page for me which again I never use and I think it's hard for me to access and it's very difficult for me to know what to do with my mobile telephone. It keeps, uh, you know, shutting down and it's very difficult for me but in a conference where people are techies and people are very, very high technology, I'm a bit out of place but thank you very much for nevertheless for giving me this opportunity. You know, when you travel in an aircraft, you hear a, uh, an announcement that before you try and help somebody else, put the oxygen mask on your own face. Because if you don't do that, the chances that you're going to help anybody, including yourself, is very, very slim. A country, therefore, has got to put the oxygen mask firmly on its own face and make sure of its own survival and its own growth and its own development before trying to do anything else, such as what we tried in the 1950s and 60s to reform the world. So it's very, very important to begin by reforming ourselves and improving ourselves. Now, regrettably, in the early years of our independence, the focus was on changing the world and reforming the world. And the world is a huge place. It's got continents, it's got people, it's got different rivers. So I really can't blame the leaders of India for forgetting about India, I mean a relatively small corner of the world, when they were trying to save the world. So we have a situation in which we declined the UNSC seat. In fact, we declined the Sultan of Oman's offer to give us the Gwadar port in Pakistan. At that time, Gwadar, Baluchistan, as you know, is a very heavy uh, Omani influence. At one time, it was part of the Sultanate of Oman. And the Sultan of Oman offered us the port of Gwadar which, for some reason, we declined. We have a long history of this tradition of putting others first. Now, I have no objection to putting others first, provided we are at least second. My problem is that if we put others first and we are 99th, then we have a problem. So, you have, for example, I'm sorry to say Tashkent, where we vacated certain places from where terrorists could subsequently come into India. We have a situation in Shimla, where the entire gains of the war were surrendered. And that, of course, has been well talked about. What is not being talked about is the fact that the Bangladesh war was fought by a coalition of the Indian Army and the Bangladeshi forces. After the surrender, the surrender of Pakistan troops took place only with reference to the Indian Army. The Bangladeshi partners of India were nowhere in the picture. Subsequently, a lot of human rights atrocities had been committed into Bangladesh, but subsequently the decision to in effect pardon these human rights violators and send all of them back to safety to Pakistan was taken exclusively by India without any reference to our Bangladeshi partners. I'd like to say very frankly that when there is a coalition, whether a coalition government or a coalition in fighting a war, all partners of that coalition have to be treated with respect. And if that's not done, you have problems in future. And certainly we have had multiple problems with Bangladesh in future for the simple reason that at the start itself, we ignored them. And we ignored the pain and trauma that they were going through. And we ignored the fact that humanity and human rights mandated the fact that we should have put at least several hundred officers and men of the Pakistan army guilty of the worst acts of crimes against humanity on trial. This is not done. Now, of course, there are, I can go at, I mean, very, very, at great length on the fact in which we are holding ourselves back. And the nuclear program in India is one such example. We could have developed a nuclear weapon. I mean, we had Homi Baba who mysteriously died. But we could have developed a nuclear weapon at the same time as China did. We did not. We went in for 1974. After 1974, we went to sleep. And then finally, it was resurrected uh, by the NDA in 1998. And a, a second explosion took place. We needed several more to perfect our deterrent. 
We needed several more to improve our delivery capacities, our trigger mechanisms, our safety mechanisms. Unfortunately, after 1998, these additional blasts have not taken place. And we have gone in for a nuclear deal, which in effect has meant the abandonment of the three-stage program you know, worked upon by Dr. Homi Baba. Today, the thorium program in India is as good as dead. Today, the program of indigenization of nuclear technology is faltering very, very sharply. And in exchange, we have very expensive technologies from outside. And we are now trying to build uh, nuclear reactors of a form which are in a quote-unquote safe. By safe, we mean that there is no way that the material in that can be weaponized. But the reality is, the next 15 years, if not 20 years, are going to see 50 declared nuclear powers on, in the world. My own estimate is at least 20 to 25 countries are going to be overtly nuclear in the next 20 years. You're going to have Iran, probably other countries in the region. You're going to have other many countries. And in that situation, the only defense is a strong nuclear deterrent. And regrettably, we have gone not only very slow on this defense, we have, in fact, scaled back the, the deterrent of nuclear first thing that we have. Now, as I said, you know, this question of putting others first comes into economic policy as well. Now, we have Sucheta Dalal here, whom I have a lot of respect for, for many years, for the amazing work that she has done in exposing the fact that the Indian stock market, frankly, is, is a fixed uh, roulet wheel. I mean, you have... In, you know, in, in some parts of the world, you've got roulette wheels which are fixed. And the Indian stock market, regrettably, is a fixed roulette wheel. And I think no one has done more to bring that fact out than Sucheta. But you have a high interest rate regimen in India. You have a lot of regulations in India. All to ensure that liberalization in India means making it easy for foreign companies to come to India and as difficult as possible for Indian companies to operate not only abroad, but in India as well. I'll give you just one example of that, and that is the defense sector. Since the 1980s especially, there has been a huge increase in the foreign component of the defense sector. Any effort at indigenization has really virtually been given up. And as a result, today, more than 87% of critical technologies of the armed forces of India are dependent on foreign suppliers for maintenance, for spares, and for original equipment. Contrast this with China, where over the last 10 years, the proportion has fallen from around 70% to less than 20% today. The Chinese are 80% indigenized in the last 10 years, and we are nearly 90% dependent on foreign sources in defense technology. There have been occasional statements by various defense ministers that the Indian private sector will be allowed a share in defense. So far, these have remained mostly statements. The fact is that rather than Indian companies, it is foreign companies that are given the first, second, third, and 99th priority in our defense procurement. As I said, I have no objection to getting second priority or even ninth priority. The problem is the 100th priority, and that is what is given to Indian private companies in this field of defense procurement in India. So you have multiple sources of power in India. You have got business power. The Indian entrepreneur, the Indian businessman is a very vibrant individual who can really transform the world. But he is given no assistance whatsoever, whether in this country or abroad, and in fact is severely handicapped. We have a vast store of soft power. Our culture, our traditions, our natural friendliness has given rise to music, to films, to, to, to literature, and to so much else that is a vast store of soft power in India. This has spread abroad purely by its own strength and not at all as a result of any state policy. Indeed, once again, state policy acts as a hindrance to this kind of soft power rather than an advantage to it. Now, what is, frankly, the reason for this extraordinary state of affairs? Why is it that in 2013, China is three times more developed than India in terms of the total gross national product, 
when in 1949, when Mao Zedong declared that the People's Republic had been formed, China was less than half the economic size of India. From half the economic size of India to three times the size of India is the extent of their success or the extent of our failure. The reason is the fact that in 1947, the British Union Jack came down and the tricolor went up, but very little changed beyond that. We retained the entire panoply of British era colonial law. Now, I've been to Britain, I've been to Commonwealth countries, and I must confess, I like Britain, I like Commonwealth countries. I'm very much of an Anglosphere buff. I believe in a 21st century Anglosphere. I believe that a billion Indians should learn to speak English, and it's very good if a billion Indians speak English. But the law in Britain is very different from the law in India. British law in Britain or British originated law in Australia or Canada or New Zealand, the so-called dominions before independence, is very different from British law in India or Kenya or Malaya or any of the colonial countries whose citizens they regarded as slaves and subjects. Colonial law gives vast discretionary powers to the state. It makes those in authority have total control over almost every aspect of the lives of the citizens. That's not the case with British law in Britain. That's definitely not the case with the British originated law in, say, Australia, New Zealand, or Canada, but it's very much the case in India. After 1947, our freedom fighter uh, uh, heroes and heroines, they made no effort whatsoever to change the colonial structure of law to change the colonial structure of administration, to change the colonial structure of policing, to change the colonial structure of the justice system into an independent structure which is suited to free people rather than a subject people. The result is the powers of the state remain vast and as a result, of course, the benefits to those who run the state in terms of bribes and illicit income are also vast. They, the reason why they opposed any change in the colonial structure was that they were very, very comfortable with the vast increase in power that they had post-1947. And they didn't want to shed this power. But until the state sheds this power, until the law in India gets altered to, to suit the fact that India is a free democracy, that Indians are free people, I can tell you, conditions in India are very, very unlikely to change for the better anytime soon. I'm sorry to say that no government in India, whether it's the Congress, whether it's the coalition, whether it's the NDA, no government made the slightest effort to change colonial law in India, possibly because they were very happy at the immense discretionary powers to the state which are there in that law. I mean, the Indian Police Act in 1862, I'm not sure about the, the Indian uh, the penal code. I think it's even older than that. It's older than that. It's ridiculous. In a situation in which, for example, we're talking of a people's conference. We're talking of computer programs. And computer programs evolve, I'm told, in milliseconds. They don't evolve in seconds. They evolve in nanoseconds and milliseconds. And today we have a system by which you have a legal framework, you have an administrative framework that's more than 100 years old. And more importantly, it came into being after the 1857 War of Independence when the colonial authority lost all confidence in its ability to fool the Indian people. So it's a system which is rooted in mistrust of the people, rooted in contempt for the people, and rooted in the desire to control this people as much as they possibly can. And this is the structure which unfortunately our so-called freedom fighters have bequeathed to us after freedom and till today, 2013, to this very day. I mean, all of you know the Information Technology Act of the Government of India. I've written a piece in today's Sunday Guardian about that, and I may be unpopular in some factors because of my liberal attitude. But the fact of the matter is, this is an act which probably North Korea, I would have seen and thought is normal in North Korea, but certainly not in a country which calls itself a democracy. This is an act where if you get spam into your folder, you're sent to jail for many years. If you open that spam, you're sent to jail for double the number of years. And if you forward that spam to somebody else, you're sent to jail for seven, eight, ten years. This is absurd. You know, the state is speaking into your private privacy, 
peeking into all that and tens of millions of people can be affected by that ridiculous information technology act that regrettably was passed without any opposition from any major political party in the country so i'd like to say very clearly that in this every political party in the country is equally guilty of retaining the colonial structure and ensuring the passage of laws which are colonial era laws and which are frankly giving excuses to policemen to send people to jail i was making a calculation back in manipur there are some 600 authorities in india with the right to take away your property or your liberty either your property or your liberty all kinds of officers all kinds of departments of central state and district governments are empowered to take away the, your right to property and your right to liberty the income tax department can look at me and say your income is 20 crores and the income tax officer can say i believe it's 20 crores he can seize my bank deposits he can he can make life a hell for me and i have no recourse to the legal system because many of these actions are outside the purview of courts and secondly if i go to the court it is going to be the i mean you know 30 or 40 or 50 years later that the verdict is given and with the best advances in medical science i am not entirely sure i am going to live for 50 more years you know i am not i am not certain of that at all so you have no recourse at all now of course well, since 2004 we have had an immense increase in these laws we have had an immense increase in regulation and we have gone back to the indira gandhi period when there was minute and micro regulation we have abandoned the narasimha rao period where manmohan singh was a prime minister to be frank with you for sorry finance minister manmohan singh has completely walked away from the narasimha rao period of liberalization and he is now presiding over an indira gandhi style period where you have regulation every step of the way now you might ask me what all this has got to do with foreign policy the fact of the matter is like there is no longer a difference between internal and external terrorism today the internet makes you go all over the world aircraft can make you go all over the world railways and ships even go all over the world domestic and international terrorism have come together in the same way domestic and foreign policy have come together so long it's very very difficult now to make a logical watertight division between foreign policy and domestic policy and the domestic situation domestic policy domestic institutions have a huge impact on foreign policy and the colonial mindset of the people in government seeing people outside government as children as people who need adult supervision not only children but mischievous children criminally oriented children children who need to be very firmly controlled this system has an impact on foreign policy where again we are seeing india in a sense as a much more inferior country and we are giving advantages to others because we believe india really doesn't deserve any advantage india being an very you know inferior kind of country now this situation has been evolved allowed to evolve and let's examine some of the consequences of this globally looking at what is happening across the world today let's for example look at latin america at south america now south america is a is a continent where for a very long time local traditions were suppressed by settlers from europe who brought their own traditions with them and who completely suppressed local traditions they gave a very deep sense of inferiority to the local people when the fact is the civilization of the mayas and the incas were at one time way more progressive and way more developed than any civilization in europe now india should by by nature relate to these new trends in latin america india by nature should relate to these cultural increase the increase in cultural activity in latin america the effort by the majority populations of latin america to shed this yoke of inferiority to european settlement and european style uh, uh, world view and going for an authentically south american world view unfortunately let us be honest we are not on their side at all in fact we are still taking the side of the european settlers of the european world view rather than take the side 
of the local, in, I mean, I wouldn't use the word indigenous people, because that's a pejorative expression in many parts of the world. I use the word local people. We should take the side of the local people. We should relate to governments led by local people who are now challenging this old elitism and this old order. And regrettably, we are not doing that at all. Neither are we doing that in Africa. Another country where, for example, France has got hegemonic control over several countries in Africa. It freely uses its military to suppress uh, popular movements in these countries. And yet for a long time in the United Nations system, it has been the monopoly of France to head the UN peacekeeping operations. To head, and of course, it's a monopoly of the NATO bloc countries. You know, NATO has been extremely active militarily. It has bombed and, and blasted its way across many countries. The NATO bloc countries today control the human rights mechanism of the United Nations. The NATO bloc country, France, controls through military force a large number of countries in Africa. And I'm sorry to say, rather than oppose it, India, in fact, is siding with them, going along with them, rather than opposing it. I mean, this is frankly to me extraordinary given the fact that we were the first country to have, by one means or the other, get independence. Now, I have my own theories as to why the British left, and, one, and the theory that I have is that it was related to the Indian Army and the Indian, and the Indian Navy. The fact was that after 1944, after 1945, after Subhash Chandra Bose and the INA came on the scene in a big way, the British were no longer sure that the armed forces in India would be loyal to them. They were no longer confident that they could use Indians in uniform to suppress the hundreds of millions of Indians who are not in uniform. As a consequence, and if you look at many of the files in British era, this thing, in fact, if someone makes an authoritative study of that, the impact of the perception, and which is, I think was reality, that the armed forces of India were in a situation by which they were turning against the British colonial masters, I think this was the single most decisive factor persuading England to, end, to give up its uh, Union Jack in India and to withdraw to India. We have a whole historiography based on various factors of independence, but the reality is that the role of the armed forces and the role of the INA and the role of Subhash Chandra Bose in conscientizing the men and women in uniform to shed this British yoke has never been mentioned even once. And I think it's a shame that this has not been done irrespective of which government has come to power. Now, let's turn to, let's turn to West Asia. Now, for a very long time, right from 1992-93 onwards, I have been warning of the dangers of Wahhabism. Now, I'd like to make one thing very clear, is that I am a hard secular person. I am 100% secular, and I do not believe in any differentiation based on religion, caste, community, or region, or race in any part of the world. I strongly believe that the traditions that we have in India are Indian traditions, and that these traditions, the, the books that we have, the, the literature that we have, the epics that we have produced, they are as much a part of Indians of any faith as they are a part of Indians of a particular faith. They belong to all of India and they need to be seen as belonging to the whole of India. Given that situation, I am extremely worried about the growth of Wahhabism for the simple reason that it is, this is an ideology which preaches ruthlessness, a complete absence of compassion, and violence across the world. Now, the danger is that the education system in large parts of the world have become Wahhabized. Take the example of Central Asia. If you go to Central Asia, you will find the education system there collapsed after the fall of the Soviet Union. What took its place was not a modern education system. What took its place was a Wahhabized education system with money from Qatar, Saudi Arabia and other locations where Wahhabis are plentiful. With the result that today the people in Central Asia who are the age that most of you are, are actually being brought up on an extremely Wahhabite education diet. The same situation takes place in Pakistan. The same situation takes place in many other corners of the world including West Asia. And this is increasingly going to lead to a level of intolerance, a level of bigotry, a level of confrontation 
that is going to seriously impact international security. Even in India, you have institutions that spread this kind of education. And I'd like to say very clearly, I'm against any intolerance in education, no matter which, in which religious school spreads it, no matter in which religion it is spread, for a simple reason that I firmly believe all of us come from the same supreme being that is mentioned in the Gayatri Mantra. We all come from that very same supreme source. So in a very real sense, in a very cosmic and spiritual sense, we are all brothers and sisters of one another. Now, in this situation, let me come to a, and a second point. In, I am a friend of Israel, and I must confess that I believe the Jewish people are person to person. They are the most productive people in the whole world. I think if you look at every hundred people from the Jewish community, they have done more for science, for technology, for education, for literature than any thousand people of any other community. I have no hesitation saying that based on statistical data. It has nothing to do with any subjective feeling. But I'd like to say that Israel made a huge mistake in 1982. That mistake was intervening in the Lebanese civil war. Ariel Sharon intervened on behalf of a Maronite Christian group of, uh, led by the Kamayal brothers. And this group massacred large numbers of Shia Mus Muslims in Lebanon. As a consequence, the only country in the world which is a victim of Shia terrorism is Israel. Wahhabi terrorism is across the world. In, now we have just seen in, in Boston, where an individual who is given under a, I mean, with, given uh, what is it called asylum has repaid that asylum in the only way that Wahhabis know, which is set off a bomb. So we have seen that. We have seen that in in, in different locations. Now today, what is happening? NATO is supporting Wahhabism in West Asia. In, in, you know, in the case of Libya, Colonel Gaddafi may have had his psychological problems, but the reality was he was liberal in terms of his theology. There was absolutely no illiberalism in his theology as against those who believe women should not drive, women should not wear any kind of dress they want, women should not even work. So that is not the case in Libya. He was removed. In Syria today, the the, the, uh, the only reason why this vicious attack has come on Bashar Assad is because Assad is a Shia. In fact, he's not only a Shia, he's an Alawite. And Alawites are seen as a Shia of the Shia. Means they're even more liberal than normal Shia. So they're seen as ultra-liberal. I mean, you go to Syria, for example, you'll almost never see an Alawite lady wearing uh, this thing. or you'll never, you'll, They're indistinguishable from people in, let's say, in Europe. Because they're very modern people. Now, this is anathema to people who are Wahhabi. And unfortunately, Wahhabis have ganged up to destroy Mr. Bashar Assad. Now, I have, I have absolutely nothing to say in favor of the Assad dynasty. I have nothing to say in favor of the government of Syria, which frankly has been as incompetent as the Indian governments have been till 1992 and post-2004. It's been as incompetent as that. But the reality is the battle against Assad is because he's a Shia. So today, you have America telling Iraq, which is a majority Shia state, that look, you must give a lot of oil money to the Sunnis, even though the Sunnis have no oil. The Sunnis don't have oil in their territory, but you must give at least 40% of the oil money to the Sunnis. That's only fair. In Saudi Arabia, where 90% of the oil comes from Shia populated areas, the United States does not say that you must give even 1% of the oil money to the Shia. The United States is not bothered about the Shia or Saudi Arabia at all. If they are so bothered about justice that they want the Sunni minority in, uh, in Iraq to be looked after, what about the Shia minority in Saudi Arabia? They are completely silent about that. Now, they are talking about Bashar Assad. He is a Shia, he is a minority ruling a majority Sunni state. Well, what about Bahrain? Every day there are mass protests in Bahrain because Bahrain is overwhelmingly Shia ruled by a Sunni king. I'm happy to say he's not Wahhabi, he's Sunni. He's not Wahhabi at all. Unlike his cousins in Saudi Arabia, unlike his cousins and nephews in Qatar, he's not Wahhabi, but he's still a Sunni and the Shia majority. So on, in Syria, you have one yardstick because the man in charge is a Shia. In Bahrain, you have a different yardstick because the population agitating is Shia. This is creating a perception that the entire Western world is going against the Shia. My fear is that just as Israel 
has been the, was in the past the single target of attack by Shia terrorism, which in my view as an analyst is much more deadly than Wahhabi terrorism. Israel is suffering from a much more deadlier form of terrorism than most of us are. It's a very deadly form. Shia terrorism can spread across the world in response to NATO's crusade against the Shia. Now, regrettably, India is joined that crusade. India is now supporting NATO in Syria. India is now supporting the Wahhabi individuals across the Middle East. And we are in danger of losing our position of neutrality in the Middle East. Now, as someone from Kerala especially, as someone from India and someone from Kerala especially, this concerns me a great deal. There are 7 million Indians working in the Middle East. Every one of those 7 million can be potential hostages. And we don't have the money and the resources and frankly the political willpower to do anything to save even 10 of them if they are in trouble. Now, they are safe only because till now India has remained neutral in the many conflicts in the Middle East. And we need to continue to remain neutral in the many conflicts in the Middle East and not take sides. Not take sides of Shia, Sunni or any of the kind. We should remain neutral for the protection of our citizens and for access to oil and more importantly access to capital. But we are not getting neutral. We are entering slowly. We are being slowly entering the war on behalf of NATO against the Shia. And this is going to make, make India also be included in the arc of Shia terrorism that's going to spread to the Western world because of this very unwise policy. I don't want to, to what do I say, you know, uh, belabor my welcome in this audience by talking. Dr. Swami knows that I can talk for three hours flat and just get warmed up. So he's giving me some very worried looks. But I promise you, Dr. Swami, that this is the final segment of my, of my talk. I just want to say that, you know, we shouldn't suffer from this colonial mindset of being ashamed of our country, ashamed of its history, ashamed of its epic. When I go to Greece, people are very proud of the Iliad, extremely proud of the Iliad. When I go to Rome, and frankly, Rome is the only part of the world where I've gone twice, and each time I've been pickpocketed. So, I have never been pickpocketed. I have never been pickpocketed anywhere else in the world except each time in Rome. So clearly, there's something about Rome which doesn't agree with me. You know. I, I, you know, uh, for, I, I'm not going to answer that question. But I, I'd simply like to say that, you know, we now in India, the Bhagavad Gita, the Ramayana, I mean, you have a whole lot, I mean, the entire curriculum of India. You know, you can go through your school education, your college education, your doctoral education without even knowing that there was a Ramayana or a Mahabharata or a Panchatantra or so many important items of literature and epics that are so integral to the concept of who we are. Now, I'd like to say very clearly, I don't regard the Ramayana and the Mahabharata as belonging to any particular religion. They belong to the whole world. They belong to humanity. Just as I'd like to say that Swami Vivekananda, for example, frankly, Swami Vivekananda is much more of a mascot to India than the mascot that was established by the BJP when Mr. Vajpayee and Mr. Advani others formed the BJP, namely Mahatma Gandhi. I think Vivekananda, quite frankly, has got much more to teach this country than any other mascot in this country who was born in the last 200 years. I'd like to say that quite openly. So the point is to instill a pride in our country. Now for me, for example, why do I support the Ram Tetu agitation? It's not because of any kind of, you know, any kind of religious feeling. It's purely because I believe Lord Ram is a fact of Indian history. I've gone to Sri Lanka and Sri Lankans have pointed with pride to the locations where Sita was, the location where she was rescued. They have preserved and protected those areas. Have we preserved and protected a single one of those areas? Again, I'm sorry to say they were not protected in 1998 and 2004 as well, I'm sorry to say. But I hope they will be protected in 2014 if a, if a combination comes to power. I'd like to say that, you know, when you 
glorify the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. You are not glorifying a religion. You are not glorifying a country. You are glorifying an ethos that is integral to being a good human being. And that is what we need to understand. That India is a country whose ethos is integral to being a good human being. And that ethos is non-denominational, is non-religious. I mean, I don't like to see Western commentators use the term Hindu nationalist. Because a nationalist accepts every Indian who's proud of being an Indian as an Indian. Any Indian who's proud of being an Indian is an Indian, a full Indian, and entitled to be treated with the same respect, the same attention, and which is why I am opposed, for example, to many of the, uh, as being a secular person, I am opposed to these secular policies, as, for example, this policy of discriminating, for example, in favor of, let us say, minority groups in India. Now, I would like to acknowledge that much damage was done to the underprivileged scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. I stand 100% reser behind reservation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe because they have suffered for thousands of years. But I want to ask you, during the Mughal period, was it Hindus who were nasty to the Muslims of India? During the British period, was it Hindus who were nasty to the Christians of India? I don't think so. The, the, the Mughals were nasty to everybody in India, whether they were you know, Muslims who were born from India or Hindus or whatever. The British were nasty to everybody in India, whether they were Hindus, Muslim or Christian. So there is no, absolutely no logical ground for this kind of discrimination and this kind of affirmative action because there is no historical wrong to right. In the absence of a historical wrong, all one can conclude is that this is a way of keeping the different communities of India apart. You all know that the colonial people, especially the British, especially the British, had a policy of backing minority groups in every part of the world. In Sri Lanka, for example, they backed minority groups. In Malaya, they backed minority groups. In Kenya, they backed my minority tribes. In India, they backed minority groups. And this is merely a continuation of that policy. I believe as a secular Indian, that every Indian in this country, irrespective of denomination and religion, should be treated 100% equally. I believe that if churches and mosques are exempt from state regulation, temples should very definitely be freed from the clutches of the state. I believe that if we have a Right to Education Act, in which 25% of the seats are given for poor children, I have no objection to that. I say, okay, the government has failed miserably. Let's hope the private sector succeeds. But whether the schools are started by Hindus, Muslims, or Christians, all of them should have the same social obligation. You cannot have a situation in which only schools of one community have got the social obligation and the others do not have. I am sure my Muslim and Christian friends will be very happy to accept this obligation and of, of, of educating 25% poor children for the simple reason that the only way we can make India a really secular society is to ensure that these artificial colonial era kind of separations between different communities are ended. And secondly, this colonial era, looking at our past, looking at our epics, looking at our traditions and history as something which we are ashamed of, something that should not belong to curricula, something that should not belong to normal political discourse. As this is a mindset that is a colonial mindset in tune with our colonial laws, our colonial police, our colonial administration, and sadly, a colonial foreign policy. I hope the one thing that I am very happy about is the fact that through social media, a kind of freedom is there which is not there in the print media and television media in this country. The long arm of the income tax, the long arm of the enforcement directorate, the long arm of the CBI, and the CBI, I can tell you, is a master in making innocent people look like criminals and making criminals look like saints. I mean, it's a master organization, you know, in that. The enforcement director is also, I mean, trillions of dollars have been salted away, and you have this enforcement director. Given this record, every single past director, the enforcement director, should be in jail today because they have miserably failed to check the outflow of black money. I mean, the, look at the record. And, and in, instead of which, of course, they are you know, given the same kind of privileges that the British. I mean, our ministers have got their red lights. I mean, they've got their cars. 
they got their special routes, they got their special privileges, our senior officials have that. I've gone to countries where, frankly, I've been invited by cabinet ministers to dinner. I go to the minister's office, and after that, the minister and I travel in a taxi without security to his house for dinner because he, his official car is only used for official purposes, and taking me for dinner was not regarded an official purpose. We have to have a ruling system like that in India. And we have to hold our political people accountable to that kind of system. I just want to say that with the growth of social media, with the growth of conscientization, with the growth of social consciousness and civil society's emergence in India, I, for the first time, am beginning to hope that a truly democratic and free society, a truly secular society will emerge in India and out of that will come a truly Indian-oriented foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you.